So good afternoon and thanks for bearing with us whilst you just got everything set up here. Um, we're going to be doing link analysis in networks or finding the terrorists. Um, I'm James McGiven, I work for Cisco, I live in London um, and I do have a blog but you won't find much there because I'm terrible at writing posts. So what we're going to do today is we're going to have a look at what link analysis is, we're going to look at the motivations, the history that's gone on that have caused this topic to be studied. Uh, we're going to go through some graph theory basics. It's going to be a refresher course. Probably, for some of you, you'll have done this at school or maybe even university. Network theories builds on top of the graphs. Uh, a couple of basic concepts in that that you're going to need to know before you can talk about uh, some of the link analysis uh, algorithms that we're going to cover later. Um, and then we're going to have a look at link analysis in the wild because obviously I'm sure everybody here has heard about the recent uh, governmental spying that's been going on and obviously they collect vast amounts of data and you have to do something with that. Uh, otherwise you've just got terabytes and terabytes of, of useless data and not information and, and information is what you're after. Uh, and we'll also have a quick look at uh, what you can do to start using some of these algorithms where you work or at home for fun. So what is link analysis? Well, it, it's pretty much what it sounds like. It's analysing the links between people or computers or various elements of different networks. And we do this because sometimes we want to know, for example, if it's a, if it's a drug dealing ring, which person do we have to arrest to take out most of the network and disrupt the supply chain? Um, likewise, can we say, infer that there is a Mr. Big Bad somewhere out there that we haven't met yet from the people he talks to? Um, we also look at the way that networks are structured and, and the way inside of a network there are sub-networks um, and these have various properties and by looking at these properties you can make assumptions or assertions about that network. Um, we're also going to have a quick look at how you get stuff ready to be used by link analysis. Um, one thing I'm going to cover first though is, is organised crime versus terrorism. So the main difference between these is that organised crime is generally about finance. It's about money. People just want money. The political stuff that goes with it, like you've seen in the mobster films where they're buying off politicians and doing backhanded deals to get casino licences. That's just incidental. The main purpose they have is getting money and becoming rich and not getting arrested. Terrorists, however, tend to be more ideological. They have a religion or a cause that they're trying to champion. Uh, and so that's the main difference between organized crime and terrorism. However, the way that their networks are structured and organizations are structured is very similar in a lot of cases. So if we just have a quick look back through time, and this is going to be a real, this isn't going to be a time team, let's dig for two hours before we find a single brick, no, really fast. Since we don't know when, we've had pirates and gangs and highway robbers, you know, you've all heard of Dick Turpin, and I'm sure there's some local person in your own country's history that's just as nefarious and has done bad deeds over time. But when you get to about 4 BC, you know, this is when civilization starts writing down in detail what's going on, and we start being able to say with more certainty the stuff that's happening. And during Rome's expansion, they went up towards Germany, um, which at the time was being ruled by the Vandals and the Goths, um, which obviously those words mean different things in English nowadays, but these were just groups of people. Um, and they weren't organized crime, and they weren't terrorists. But the way they organized themselves into raiding parties and, and sort of the centralized command that would push things down into little network cells, very much similar, very much similar. Come the 1800s, you know, this is about five decades, uh, five centuries later, we start to see much more organized crime gangs like the Accuser from Japan, the Mafia from Italy and Sicily, the Mafia from Russia, um, and of course the Triad from China. Um, all huge gangs, they have been going for centuries now, and uh, they're still going. We had the La Costa Nostra, the cartels, ethnic gangs, syndicates, IRA more recently, you know, these are part gang, part terrorist organization. Even more recently, ETA was uh, set up in the 1970s and only recently just disbanded. 
Um, and they caused a lot of problems for Spain uh, whilst they were trying to get freedom for their part of the country. The last two, Al-Qaeda and Anonymous, they're the most recent in terms of, you know, newly formed organizations, but they're also the most anomalous on this list because neither of them are traditional organized crime or organized terrorist networks. They are a new breed that are slowly being come to known as disorganized crime because the information used to flow both ways from the soldiers at the bottom of the street all the way up to the big boss in his palace. And so you could track that information flow one way or the other. Now you've got one guy at the top that sends messages down. None of the cells reply to him. So it's very hard to backtrace to the big guys using the traditional methods that were used to take down the mafia during the sort of 60s and 70s. As you can see, I don't know if you only saw this like two, three weeks ago. This was in the news. Uh, this is the Guardian clipping. Uh, basically, the Yakuza have been getting banks to give them dodgy loans. So, you know, this isn't stuff that's just about drugs and guns. They actually infiltrate virtually every element of our lives, whether we like it or not. Um, and we just have to work out how to deal with that and make sure we're vigilant and that they don't take advantage. So... What tools do we have? Well, this is Zeroth Generation. It's actually a bit of a cop-out. This is uh, from Flash Forward, a TV show that was terrible. But it used to work. You know, they did see the detectives and they'd have a board on the wall and pins in this and bits of string linking one to the other. And that's, that's basically where these sort of uh, mathematical ideas grew from, was from this very crude system. The next generation um, is... Basically, mathematicians coming and joining the party. And you had these, you know, this is a computer generated one, they used to be hand drawn at this point in time. It's called an Anna Kappa chart. And uh, this, the big solid black circles you see means that this is um, a known, confirmed suspect. The, the hollow ones are uh, maybe, might be a suspect. And then the pluses are key person of interest. And if you track along, you'll see that the lines with pluses on don't go to a person's name, they go to a company's name. So this chart is capturing both people's interaction with each other and the places they work at. The next generation basically built on this because these were all hand-drawn charts. We introduced new software, GUI, you could drag things around. Um, and we started seeing some of the first generation tools that are still in use, like i2. Uh, Netmap less so, crime flow is still, still around. Um, and the biggest benefit of these is that before, if you had one of those Anacapa charts and you wanted to update it by adding a new row in the middle, you'd have to redraw the entire thing by hand. Now it's just done with a click of a mouse. But they are just a tool. They need someone with expert knowledge to work them. Um, and when these people do, they end up drawing diagrams like this. So this is um, the same chart, but drawn out to show the overlapping association between the companies and the actors, the people. Um, and this type of chart, obviously, you could see it quite easily being about, say, mafia hierarchy or something like that. Third generation is where we are now. Um, things are really changing at quite a pace. Uh, big data, obviously, is been on everyone's lips for the past couple of years and it's making a real inroads in how crime and terrorism are tackled and detected. Uh, you don't need an expert, you have an expert built into the software. It pulls stuff from Twitter, from Facebook, from phone records. You keep naming sources of data that are now available. These people are using them to track down terrorists or even us. Not only that, but because our computers have got so much more powerful, we can process vast networks of people now. As before, you know, 20, 30 people, with the algorithms get hard to calculate by hand. Now we're talking billions of people and relationships between them. So I just want to digress here, uh, because this is uh, an interesting uh, sort of this distinction that we're going to work on later, is deduction versus inference. So deduction is, given all the data I know now, what can I deduce? What can I work out with certainty? So if I saw it was raining outside and I saw you come through the front door wet, I know that you've been walking in the rain. Well, pretty sure. 
someone could have thrown a bucket of water of you just before you came through the door. But you, that's deducing that you've been walking through the rain. Inference is a bit more probabilistic. You might say, well, he's out of breath. Maybe he's asthmatic. Maybe he's been for a run. You don't know. There's not enough information to say with any degree of certainty, but you're making an inference. And this is important when we start trying to work out whether a tool is telling you that it's inferring someone is a terrorist or whether it's deduced that someone is a terrorist. So let's go back to uni. Let's do some graph theory. Um, an undirected graph, G, is this pair, V and E, vertices and edges. Uh, edges are basically another pair which have the start and the end in them. Uh, in an undirected graph, because this is a set, there are no duplicate edges, and there are no direction to the edges either. Um, and this final one, if E does not contain an edge V1, V2, such that V1 equals V2, then G is a simple graph. Basically, that means if there is no loop that starts and ends on the same node, we call it a simple graph. And here's a short example. This is... Say it's the train networks between London, Paris, and Amsterdam, Madrid. Um, you can see that we've described the, the edges in pairs um, like that. So that's a simple graph. What you can do to make things a bit easier is label things. So you might label an edge with a name, like train, plane, car. Or you might give it a number, like five, which is the amount of people that can travel along that path at any one time. And that's an edge-labeled graph. A vertex-labeled graph is not what you just saw. It isn't that, because those aren't labels on the vertices. Those are the vertices. We could start coloring them. We could give London red and Madrid red and Amsterdam red and then Paris yellow. And we have a graph where no two colors are adjacent. And those colors are the labels. And there's a graph coloring algorithm, which is pretty famous. And that's what it's talking about. So we've seen an undirected graph. A directed graph is pretty much the same thing, except that the pairs are now ordered. They have a start and an end in the edge set. And what we say is that for every edge that starts at a particular node, we call that the out degree, the number of edges going outward. And the number of edges that come into the node from other nodes, or vertices, is the in degree, the number of edges coming in. So, for example, anyone that watches the Big Bang Theory might recognize this. This is the rock, paper, lizard, Spock uh, extension to rock, paper, scissor. Um, what's really important about this is that for every uh, rock, paper, scissor, lizard, Spock, it has two of them that it beats and two of them that it's beaten by. And, uh, sorry. and this is important because previously, if you have rock, paper, scissor, and we have three people, the chances of one person picking rock, one person picking scissor, and one person picking paper and forming a deadlock when none of them win is one in nine. When rock, paper, scissors, lizard, spot, because there's five, we go to one in 15, which means if you're playing with three people, there's less chance of you having a situation where no one wins. Um, a multigraph. Uh, we won't really talk about, much, um, talk about these much in this uh, talk, but they're important because you see them a lot everywhere. And... Uh, Multigraph is the same as a directed or an undirected graph, as, except for one thing. You can have more than one edge between two vertices. Um, so you can see this brilliantly on the London Underground. Uh, if you look at the yellow and green line, um, starting sort of near the bottom here, it goes James Park, Westminster, Embankment, Temple. Every one of those stations is a vertex. And the two tube lines that run side by side are edges of a multigraph. That's as simple as it is. There's, they're very realistic, much more realistic than directed or undirected, because most places in the world, most things, have more than one type of connection between them. So now we know what a graph is. 
what else can we look at in a graph? Well, what if we look at a smaller part of the graph? So what we say is that for, for any graph, G, there's a subset of its vertices and its edges. And as long as they are consistent and form a graph in themselves, we call that a subgraph. What you'll see on the left is a very simple subgraph, uh, the blue ones. What you'll see on the right is a spanning subgraph. And you'll notice there's only one white edge, and that's the edge that we're ignoring. Otherwise, we have every node connected that was in the original graph. So this subgraph is a spanning subgraph. It spans every vertex. So we've talked about graphs as maybe transport networks. And this goes back ages and to uh, Euler uh, had this problem called the Bridges of Königsberg, um, which is what you can see on the screen here. So we've got this river with an island and bridges and things on either side. And the challenge was to walk every single path, crossing it only once. And hopefully most of you should know that that's impossible with this graph. Um, it's uh, quite a nice proof. But what we're going to look at is walking. So a walk is um, any collection of edges that you trail across. If it starts and ends in different places, we call it an open walk or a path. And if it uh, starts and ends, say so they both start and end on A, we call it a closed one um, or trail. Um, we also call, call a closed walk a cycle because you walk in a loop. And uh, the only thing is we say that a cycle must have more than one length. So you can't have a zero length cycle. That's the only restriction we have. Any graph that has a subgraph that contains a cycle or a cycle graph, then it is said to be acyclic. And an acyclic directed graph, or a DAG, is also called a tree. And uh, I'm sure you've all come across tree data structures before. They are just a sub-special case of graphs. So we've got basic graphs, we've got subgraphs, we've got walks. The next type of graph we're going to look at is the complete graph. So a complete graph is one where every vertex is joined to every other apart from itself. So it doesn't have a self-loop, but otherwise it's connected to every other vertex. So a triangle, like that, is connected. A square with crosses is also connected. Um, a clique. A clique is a subgraph that is a complete graph. So if we have a look, on the left we have a complete graph, K5. Uh, five nodes, and as you can see, every node has four edges on it. So it's a complete graph. If you look at the triangle, it's not a complete graph because you ha can't go from one corner to the top or vice versa. You have to go through an intermediate node. However, there are four cliques here, four little triangles. Each one's a clique. It's that simple. A graph is strongly connected if given any pair of vertices as a path that exists between them. So on our last example, we can say that, I point at my laptop and not the screen, um, the complete graph is strongly connected very strongly connected because one hop gets you to any other node. The, uh, the graph here with the triangles with the cliques in it, as you can see, it's strongly connected because you can go from any point in any vertex to another without a problem. The longest path you'll have to take is two in this case. So we've got some graph theory under our belts now. We know the terminology that we're going to be using to talk about network concepts. The most important part of network concepts really is the idea of communities. Um, this happens in the real life. So you're probably a member of the, some Java community. And that Java community is part of a larger Java community. So you've got overlapping ones. 
But it probably isn't part of, I don't know, the VB community. I don't think any Java com community would associate with them, so we can probably say that they're not overlapping. Um, and the other thing is that these communities are densely connected, are not necessarily strongly connected, but densely connected, as in very close to strong connections. So you go to your local Java community meetup, you'll probably know everyone there. Or if you don't, you'll know someone that does know that person. And there are ways of finding these communities within any, within any given graph. Um, there's some based on this minimum cut method, which is max flow min cut theorem, which basically says that you can uh, take a, a certain slice off the network and work out whether that has reduced or increased the flow between two parts. And the flow is defined as the ability to travel one way or another. Hierarchical clustering is, uh, it actually came from computer vision, and what you do with this is that you start breaking up links in the network to find big clusters, and then inside those clusters you make, break some more links to try and find small ones. Um, Gervan Newman algorithm is pretty popular. It's implemented in a lot of off-the-shelf software packages. However, it's quite limited because its computational complexity is um, the number of edges squared times the number of vertices. So it's, it's not linear, it's polynomial, um, and it grows quite fast as the graph grows. Uh, clique analysis is a growing area of research. As you've seen, we, we've defined cliques in the previous set, which is a, a subgraph, complete subgraph within another graph. Um, and cliques and near cliques are very lifelike in terms of real communities. One type of community in particular is called a small world. Um, and a small world is a, a, it's a network where the average distance between any two vertices is logarithmic in the size of the vertices set. Um, so small worlds, like I said, is typically comprised of cliques or near clique. A near clique is, if you added a couple more edges, it would be a clique. Um, the way that we started learning about these was through random graphs. Um, Erdos and René, which is probably famous for the Erdos number, uh, which is like the Kevin Bacon, how many degrees of separation have you got? Um, and basically what they said was, well, let's create a graph where the chance of there being an edge between any two vertices is given by this probability times the size of the vertex set. And we start, and the probability is zero, and the average... Uh, degree uh, is zero, uh, you end up with a completely disconnected graph. Um, you start increasing, so there's a fairly low chance that the graphs are going to be, uh, the edges are going to exist, and if they do, they're not going to connect to that many people, and you end up with this sort of fractured little graph. So we keep increasing, and, and things are becoming, the edges existing are becoming more probable now, and degrees are getting higher as well, which means that there are more edges present in the graph between nodes. As you can see here, it stretches across, whereas before you had sort of a big blank area in the middle. P is 1, which means that there's definitely going to be an edge. <laughs> so this is um, a huge, complete graph, um, which has arisen from this random graph model. Um, as you saw, if k is small, if it's less than 1, then you get these tiny little connected islands and, and the graph really doesn't have much connection between nodes. Um, the diameter of a graph is the um, length of the longest path. Um, so as you saw from the first one, I think we had like two nodes connected together, so that'd be a length of two. Um, as k increases to 1, uh, you start to see one big dominant cluster appear. Um, so you can start to see it appearing in the graph on the left here. Um, and then, because it's one sort of dominant cluster, you might have to walk a long way around it to get somewhere, which increases the path length. And it also increases the diameter as well, of course. Now, 
what's interesting is that k equals 1 is kind of a tipping point, because after this, it's, it's kind of like when the water starts boiling, it's a phase transition. Suddenly, we fall into a completely different scenario of graphs. When k is greater than 1, as we saw, it's strongly connected, it's nearly complete, the diameter increases because you can now walk anywhere. Sorry, decreases because you can walk anywhere. And the average path length decreases as well because everything is nearly connected. So you chances are you're talking like one, two hops to get from one place to another. And the reason why they started studying these random graph models was because if the relationship between people is modeled accurately by this, then that means that I probably know every one of you either directly or because I know someone that knows you. And I think even in a room like this, I'm probably going to push it to say that's true. And that's why that if is a massive assumption, and it's a false assumption. So what they did was that they corrected this, uh, a guy called Watt. Um, he noticed that the relationships between people aren't random. The chances of you knowing someone that you work with are much higher than the chances of you knowing someone that works in a company on the other side of the world. And likewise, the relationships are often tit for tat. You know, your friends are often friends of mine. You'll bring them to social gatherings, and you'll be able to meet them. And suddenly, it'll go from a distance of two to a distance of one. And the same goes for threes, goes to twos, and so on. So we form clusters. That's a human nature, to form these little clusters of communities. Um, and this is kind of a graph that shows this. Uh, this is actually from Watt's paper. Um, Mutual friends is a fraction of your, the total friends. As that increases, um, the chance of you becoming friends with the second degree and third degree contacts goes up. But it's still not good enough. And he carried on working on these. And what he noticed most of all was that we do form little clusters of groups. But the other thing we do is there will be people in each of our groups that knows another group completely detached. So this is back to our Java versus VB thing. You know, there might be one person that does both. And they're the connection between two very disparate communities. Um, and this is something that you've got to take into account. Um, he, he's got this factor called the beta factor. Um, and as, as beta increases, basically, the network becomes more and more small world-like, which is much more accurate of our real-world situation. But it's still not accurate enough. And scale-free networks were a mathematical curiosity. Um, over the years, people have started to realize how many networks in real life match a scale-free network. Brain, the way your neurons are composed, the way the electricity grid is composed, the way the World Wide Web is composed. It goes on. Even protein sequencing that's done by biologists, they are mapping it using this scale-free network technology. And the difference between scale-free and small world is that we have this slightly different distribution uh, before, for a small world, we just said that it was uh, proportional to this, uh, the log of the size of the vertex set. Now we've got this alpha and beta factors, which allow us to tweak the distribution. Um, and all we say is that um, for some vertices y, they have a degree x that you can calculate using this formula. And basically what this gives us is it gives us vertices whose degree, the number of edges coming in or going out, is proportional to the power law distribution. This is also probably looks familiar to you as the 80-20 rule or the long tail. Basically what we have here in the dark blue section is we have 20% of the nodes, the vertices in the network, have 80% of the connections. And the remaining 20% of the connections are spread out across the other 80% of the nodes. This means that there are some nodes which are crucial because they contain so many links to other nodes. Um, and you can see here uh, on the left is a random graph, and on the right is a scale-free graph. And I've colored the central hubs gray. Those are the 20% uh, the, the that contain 80% of the connections. 
you'd probably see if you took those nodes out, you would really start to cut apart the network. Um, they are small worlds, like we said. Um, so the idea is that the chances of you needing to go more than two, three, four hops to meet someone um, is low. The chances are that you won't be able to get to them within a relatively short distance. Those grey hubs we had, we call, uh, sorry, those grey vertices we call hubs. Um, it's kind of a, an obvious name for it. Um, it's a hub of connection, just like you have a, an airport hub where all the traffic flies in and you can do transfers like Amsterdam Schiphol. Um, but what's more important is that these hubs are supported by secondary and tertiary hubs. So on our graph back here, um, you'll see uh, pretty much bang in the middle of the graph, just sort of between those two grey nodes. That's another node that's got three connections. So it's, if you took out the grey nodes, those next ones along with, with three edges would become the new, new hubs. And what this means is it means that the, the network is quite resilient. You can take out big sections of them and they will still be able to route traffic around them. Which is why if you get hit in the head and have serious head injury, you can still make an amazing recovery. And it's because your brain follows this pattern of hubs and scale-free networks and fault tolerance. Um, the other thing is, like I said, is that hubs tend to be the connection between communities. Um, drug leaders are examples of good hubs. So we've now done graph theory, we've got some concepts from network theory. We can actually go on to talk about doing something useful, link analysis. So what we do is we are trying to look at the relationship between actors or nodes. Um, so these nodes might be documents on the web, they might be terrorists, they might be proteins. It's relationships between the nodes, that's what we're trying to track down. Most easy to access examples of these type of algorithms are obviously from the web. So we've got HITS, which is hypertext induced topic search, used by ASK, I believe. PageRank, which is not only used but developed by Google, uh, Larry Page and um, Sergey Brin. Um, and TrustRank, which is similar uh, sort of idea but very different implementation, is used by Yahoo, I believe. So what we need to do is we need some way of representing all those nice graphy pictures that we've seen up to now in a way that a computer can make sense of them. And this is where we start going back to matrices, which are essentially n, di n times m dimensional arrays. So you've got this row vector, which is a really simple column vector you're probably familiar with. Uh, two by two matrix and a two by three, and we call those rectangular because, well, it's rectangular. Obvious, really. We don't always call things stupid names in maths for the hell of it. So we want to do stuff with these matrices. When we add them together, it's quite simple. You take the element in the top left corner and you add it to the element in the top left corner of the second matrix, and so on for every other one. When you multiply a matrix by a number, so lambda here could be 10, you get 10A1, 10A2, and so on. Really simple. Transpose, what we're doing is we are flipping the matrix along its diagonal so that everything that was in the first column, A1, A2, 1, A3, 1, becomes everything in the first row. Everything in the second column becomes everything in the second row. And multiply them together. Um, I'm not going to spend too long on this because it's one of these things that you learn to do and you do it mechanically and it suddenly makes sense. But you look at an equation like this that goes, P, Q, I, J is the sum of every P, K, R, K, J. Basically what you do is you take P1, 1, and you times it with Q1, 1, and then you go across and P1, 2, and it's the column now, so times it by Q, 2, 1, and the same. So basically you're, you're going like that, and then you'll do it again, and that's how you work it out. You shouldn't actually need to do this on computers. Just 
it's already written for you in libraries, but it is always good to understand what it's, going, it's doing under the hood. So some important things to remember about matrix multiplication. A times B is not equal to B times A. We can put brackets wherever we like, doesn't matter. We can do expanding the polynomial type things. And we can distribute scalars over it. And we can also show how to work out the transpose of a uh, the product matrices. An eigenvector of a matrix is a vector which, when times by some constant, is equal to the matrix that times by the same vector. And we call it an eigenvector because it remains stationary. It's a single vector. And we call the, the constant the eigenvalue. And these don't have to be real numbers like 1, 2, 3. They can be 1 plus 2i, you know, a complex number. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to walk through working out an eigenvector. So this is our matrix here. 1, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0. And uh, up here we have the matrix times the first vector, our first eigenvector. And uh, basically what you can see here is that the eigenvalue for this vector, eigenvector is 1. Um, you can work through. It's quite simple. So we take the first one and we times it by 1, and then we add it to 1 times 0, and then we add it to 0 times 0. So it's, it's quite easy to see how that column vector multiplies with the matrix to give the same thing again. Um, the reason why this is a bit laborious about this is because it's useful in one of the algorithms we're about to talk about. Um, so we've got a pretty picture of graphs. We know some stuff about matrices. How do we combine them to do something useful? This is what we call an incidence matrix. Going back to our uh, lovely rock, paper, scissors, spot, lizard thing. Uh, an incidence matrix says if the value, uh, uh, if the node has an edge coming in, you put a 1 on it. That's it. So you can see that paper beats rock. So there's a, a 1 in that one. And uh, Spock blasts rock. So there's a 1 in that one as well. The alternative ways of doing this are adjacency matrices, which are where instead of looking at where the edges come in, you're looking at where the edges go out. Uh, incidence list and adjacency list are the same ideas apart from that you just list the edges. Uh, an edge list, you take a node and you list all the edges going out of it. Uh, and topological distance matrix is where you don't put just a one in, you put how far it is from each node to each other. Um, what we're going to start looking at now is how we identify key players in a network. So the, the words we use are centrality. Uh, we look at luminosity. Uh, and the reason why we use this term is because imagine that I am stood here in the pitch black and I have a torch. The more luminous my torch is, the more of you at the back could see me. That's how that principle works. Uh, in undirected graphs, we don't care. Obviously, it's just the number of edges for a vertex. For a directed one, we only care about outward because the light is shining away from me. I'm illuminating you all, hopefully. Um, so centrality, we can measure in a, a number of ways. There's degree centrality, which I was just talking about, where you say, given the number of edges coming out of a graph, um, you divide it by the total number of uh, nodes in the graph and you get this sort of degree of centrality. Um, those that have the highest degree are the most central. Um, closeness basically extends that one step further. So instead of just your direct neighbours, it's their neighbours and their neighbours. And it, it, depending on how far away, depends on how much they weight in on the, uh, the closeness centrality. And then betweenness is uh, basically... Given some vertex in the graph, count how many paths it's on, how many paths possible through the graph. The idea being that the most important things will be on the most paths. So this is back to town planning. To get to the centre of town, there are more paths going through the centre than there are going through some of the outskirts. And the, the town is centre is central. The other way of looking at this is prestige. Um, prestige is more to do with um, how well respected someone is or how, how well trusted that vertex is. Um, 
And you probably come across this most because this is a quite a significant one in a lot of social networks, prestige. You know, you have someone you follow on Twitter, like Matt Rival, whose opinions you either agree with very strongly or you're following him because you disagree with him strongly enough to heckle him constantly. Um, but that, that's what prestige is about. It's about how well known you are and how well that tr is trusted. Um, we have similar ideas for prestige rank and prestige proximity, um, but I'm not going to go into those right now. We're going to look at page rank instead because page rank is possibly one of the best known link analysis um, algorithms out there. And basically what it's saying is that if a website has a lot of links pointing to it, chances are it's an important website. I mean, obviously, we can all think of instantly things that are wrong with this, but this is the basic premise that uh, Larry and um, started working from. So we're going to look at what I call the simple page rank algorithm. Um, given some graph with n vertices, i.e. documents on the web, we say that the page rank for any of the uh, pages, vertices, is the sum of the incoming links over this original uh, page rank from the sources of those links divided by the out link, uh, the out degree. And the reason why we divide by out degree is to do what's called normalizing, which means that everything starts dropping into a range of one. Um, and it makes some maths nicer to work with. Um, obviously, this sounds paradoxical because you're saying, well, to work out the page rank of A, I need to know the page rank of B, C, and D. But to know the page rank of B, C, and D, I need, and it seems like a circular argument. So what you do is you give it a starting value. And we say that the, the page rank of everything is just 1 over the number of vertices. So. Given uh, the adjacency matrix of some graph, we're going to transform that into what we call a hyperlink matrix. Uh, basically, for every entry in the hyperlink matrix, if it has uh, an edge in the adjacency matrix, we give it 1 over the number of edges coming out of that node. Otherwise, we give it to 0. Uh, again, everything's normalized. Um, it makes the maths a bit easier we can now work out the page rank using matrices and eigenvectors. Um, what we notice is that the page rank for any given graph is this rank vector times the hyperlink matrix. Um, and the, the beautiful thing about this is that you can just do it iteratively. So you plug in your first one where R was, every value of R was 1 over the number of vertices. And that gives you a new R and you plug it back in and you run it against the same H and do it again and again and again until they stabilize. So let's try and work through this uh, in a practical example. So we've got a really simple graph here. Um, and this is the adjacency matrix that goes with it and the initial uh, rank vector. And you can see there were eight nodes. So we've got an eight by eight matrix and everything in R0 is 1 over 8. Next, we form the hyperlink matrix. So remember what we said about everything being added up to 1. If you look at the first column now, it's got a half and a half. Adds up to 1. So will do all the other columns. And if we run this, um, I just let it run for about 60, and it seemed to converge. But I have a feeling it actually converged a bit sooner than that. Um, we find that it stops changing. It's, it's reached a stable point, which is good. We, we don't want an algorithm that constantly just fluctuates in values. We want it to converge. Um, and what we find is, um, I've just written this as a, a row vector instead of a, a column vector, um, is that the darker colored one, sorry, three, um, and then 1, and 2, and 4, and then you see it's getting brighter, 5, 7, 6, and finally 8 is the brightest one. And that corresponds to the, the 118 um, on, a, on a rank vector. And so basically, that, that's basically ranked this network. If we were looking for something, then 
Eight's the one you go to first. But like I said, it's, it, it's a simple page rank. It has a lot of issues. It doesn't take into account a lot of real world things like dangling pages. It's pages that have no outlinks. Uh, sorry, no inlinks. So they link to everything else, but nothing links to them. Um, how, do you, how do you find that? Uh, orphan pages, they have no links to anything else, and they have no links to them. So uh, it's completely disconnected. But they would show up as an infinity in our previous algorithm. Um, a cycle in the network can cause problems, um, mainly because it changes the way the rank vector is uh, being calculated. It can cause it to never converge. Um, it would circle around a pair of values or something like that. Um, like I said, it rank syncs as well, or sort of a similar to cycles. It's where a, a small cluster ends up being a high rank because of their, their strong interconnections, but in reality, they're not supposed to be that highly ranked because they're not that influential. It's just a, it's a property of the algorithm uh, rather than a property of the graph. Um, and it's also quite sensitive to the initial vector we choose. So the one over number of edges it might sound like a good idea, but it can actually cause problems in some graphs. Um, Real page rank uses what's called sparse matrices, where some of the instead of having um, a n by m matrix with every possible value filled in, including all the zeros, a sparse matrix basically doesn't represent the zeros, so it's less space uh, intensive, which means that you can run bigger algorithms on it. Um, I think the current record is somewhere around three billion rows and columns, so it's a three billion by three billion matrix that they're computing with. Um, and the way they get around disconnected sections of the graph is that you start introducing teleportation so that at any point in time there's a probability that instead of going from this edge going from here to here, it will jump miles away in the graph. Um, and you also might come across this random surfer model um, which uses Markov chains and is far superior but far too complex to fit in uh, right now. Um, oh, seems the NSA have redacted that. Um, so we've got our page rank algorithm now. Um, we know that it's possible to do some really cool stuff with it, with web pages, but what does this have to do with terrorism and, and finding links to terrorists and stuff like that? Um, basically what we have now is we have the power for data mashups. We can pull in Twitter feeds. We've got mobile phone records that are held on databases. Um, you're scanned as you go through passport control. Uh, your emails read by the NSA. Um, basically, our lives are encoded in digital information, and the only thing that protects us is our inability to draw it all together and make meaningful sense out of it. But I don't think we will. We, we, it's going to be a problem for us soon. You know, computers are going to be so powerful that combining all this data into meaningful ways is going to be a reality. Um, some, some representations might not be suitable for analysis. So, um, you know, mobile phone calls are dead simple. Uh, it's from one person to another. But what if it's a bulletin board on the, on the internet? It's obviously, it's a lot harder. Then you have to work out what community uses a bulletin board. And then that shows you where the edges go. And it shows you where, what messages were passed to different people in an indirect manner. Um, or you might need to do some transformation. You know, you might have something that is... Uh, it, it, but for argument's sake, let's say you're going from a relational database to a graph representation. You'll have to do some munging of the data to get it fit in from one system to another. Um, but what's really important to remember is that uh, other than mathematicians, most people don't work on the command line or with pen and paper or whiteboard. They want a big GUI that they can drag things onto and color this. And so that's, that's definitely where this is all heading is, you know, Writing tools allow non-domain experts to become proficient at mining the data. So we can say that there's a similar thing to page rank called terrorist rank. You know, terrorist rank says that if you have a bunch of terrorists that talk to you all the time, chances are you're a terrorist. And if you know that they're quite important terrorists rather than just you know foot soldiers, chances are that they're all talking to a senior terrorist. So just the same way that Wikipedia comes out the top of most search results because it's an authoritarian source on these things and most things link back to it, 
In terrorist network, well, old-fashioned terrorist networks, the links would always point right back up the hierarchy. And so you'd be able to say with certainty that the, the terrorist with the, the highest uh, let's say, centrality would be the linchpin, like Osama bin Laden, for example. So how do we go about finding them? Well, to be honest, I, you know, I don't want to find them. I, I said rather the politically sensitive subject at the moment, I don't want to offend anyone, so we're going to actually talk about how to find a criminal. Um, so we've got a graph of actors and their interaction, interactions. So this could be known criminals, uh, members of the public, people that you don't, aren't sure of. Um, and you can start determining the communities they belong to by using some of the methods we talked about, such as cliques uh, or the max flow min cut. Um, there's still a bit of domain knowledge needed to know which way is the best way to do this. But it won't be too long before that's codified and automated and there'll be a wizard that says, hey, you're looking for a criminal. Would you like some help with that? Um, so once you've found the communities, uh, what you've done then is you've reduced the size of the graph a bit so it becomes a bit more manageable to work with. Um, and then you can start t calculating various metrics like centrality, prestige, terrorist rank of these subgraphs. Um, this is probably not how you would actually do it because you wouldn't want to throw away so much information. However, if you're doing stuff of your own, if you're doing these types of uh, algorithms for, say, social network analysis, or you want to do some newspaper analysis or things like this, you might want to try and filter so that your algorithm runs in a fast enough time um, for what you're trying to achieve. Um, the, the problem is, like I mentioned before, is that a lot of these algorithms, you know, you're talking about N vertices and M edges. So the possible ways that these algorithms use these can be polynomial, exponential, super exponential, which would just be lovely. Um, and what makes it worse is that it's not like just another data point. When you add a new vertex or a new edge, you change the actual relationship and properties of the graph that you're trying to analyze. And it can be a significant change. You know, you could add five edges to one node and change the entire page rank of every other node. And of course, when that's happening, you've got to recalculate. So if your algorithm is taking six hours to calculate, but you need the data in three, well, it's not really much use to you, is it? So you need to find ways of making sure that you're filtering enough, but not filtering too much, that your algorithm's fast enough for what you need but not any faster than you need it, possibly. Um, Real-world networks are often dynamic, which means that you know, if you take a dump of Facebook's graph today, I can guarantee you by, by tomorrow it will not just be slightly out of date, it will be very out of date. And this runs back into what we're saying about recalculation of data. If your real-world network that you're trying to model is changing fast, you've got to make sure that your algorithms are running fast enough and accurately enough to give you the data that you need back in the time frame that you want. Um, like I said, though, we have got better 3 billion rows, 3 billion columns. It's a huge amount of nodes and edges that we can analyze. But you need the power. Um, there are issues with link analysis that go way beyond. Uh, you know, it's easy to falsify data. We pages on the internet that used to list like millions of other links to get malware sites promoted. Uh, intentional subconscious uh, biasing from human input. All of these things have a big problem. And of course the worst is when someone turns traitor. You thought that they had a huge page rank, massively trusted. Suddenly they're selling their secrets to the Russians. Um, and this is where, at the beginning, when I said, you know, the difference between deduction and inference is deduction is often used for prosecution. It's after-the-fact analysis, whereas inference is often used to try and for crime prevention. And it's an extremely sensitive topic. This is where racial profiling at airports comes into play. Um, all these things where you're inferring about some community a general property that might not be true for the majority of that community. Um, and there is a huge amount of suspicion at the moment over whether we should be using this type of uh, 
algorithms as a conclusive method for police investigations, or whether it's tarring people with the guilty by association. Um, just a quick run through of some of the tools that you can use to get going with this. So MATLAB, very famous, people university might have used it. Um, it isn't free, so you know, don't go off rushing buying this because there are other things out there. It's just if you have this available, it's a brilliant way of getting to start playing with graph algorithms. Um, you can even wire it into production Java code if you want. Um, I, I've seen a couple of um, financial houses where the, the guys did all their algorithms in MATLAB and then the trading system would call into MATLAB and then pull the data out and, and work with it. But unless there's a, you have a motivation for that, I really wouldn't do it. Um, the cult library from CERN is basically a set of collection libraries including vectors and matrices and algorithms for working with them that are performance tuned. I mean, like they are the best performance libraries um, on, in Java that I've come across. Um, but the APIs can be a little bit odd sometimes because they're written more by mathematician term programmers and programmers mathematicians. Young is a brilliant library. Start playing with it, go on, download it, it's fantastic. You can do matrices, you can do graphs, it's got a nice OO API. It's got a, an add-on uh, that allows you to actually draw the graphs. So um, if you actually want to do some of this stuff and present it, Young has got um, a, a great set of features for doing this. Um, if, on the other hand, all you care about is the data, then Neo4j, uh, the graph database, has a community version. It's really good, really powerful. Obviously, it's got its own quirks, and if you want to do it for billions of nodes and edges, you'll have to fork out for the commercial license. Uh, um, otherwise, the best person to get information from that is Mark Needham, who works for ThoughtWorks. He's got a blog that he's been doing two, three posts a week on Node for, Node for J, for, uh, Neo for J for the past year or so. Alternatively, you can do this type of stuff on MapReduce. There's a groovy uh, library called Gremlin, uh, ScalaGraph, which I would avoid like the plague because it reminds me of those awful C++ libraries where every special operation has its own special operator symbol, like ampersand, ampersand equals ampersand, ampersand is something, and plus, plus, minus, minus means something else. No, don't bother. Um, and if anyone works with R, then you can do this stuff in R as well. So, to recap, we now know what link analysis is. We know it's about studying the relationship between actors or vertices, um, and the relationships are edges. And it's a very flexible way of representing these type of relationships. Um, we know why we've started looking at this in terms of crime prevention and terrorist detection and things like this. We've understood that the basics of graph theory underpin network theory. Um, so we need to know what directed graphs, cycle, cliques, all these things are. You, only need to, you don't need to understand them enough to work with them as a theorist. You just need to know enough so that you can choose the right algorithm to, to put on your data. Um, we know some net basic network theory now. We know about small worlds. We know about scale-free networks. We know that they have certain properties and that you can infer properties of real-life networks from these idealized networks. We've looked at a basic page rank algorithm. We haven't covered the more advanced stuff like dealing with dampening factors or uh, malicious sites and things like that. Um, and we've also looked at some of the link analysis in the wild, so some of what the NSA has been doing. And finally, I hope I've given you some, some starting points to dive in and start playing with these algorithms yourself because Really, it's not until you get your hands dirty that you'll appreciate a lot of the concepts um, and appreciate why some algorithms are better than others. Um, so we are now out of time, um, unfortunately. Uh, if you have any questions, then please come down and talk to me afterwards. Otherwise, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>